So, so welcome to CEO Talks, and, and I'm very excited um, to introduce Kopi. And before I do, once again, CEO Talks is built to provide both education and inspiration. And I, I believe I've heard tremendous feedback from employees, some of our family members, loved ones, um, even clients who have had the privilege to join, saying these are some of the greatest um, hours they've had. Um, just listening to people's life journeys, um, ups and downs, um, it really makes you understand that, that, like, you know, a lot of us are dealt life's punches in, in what feels like a very tough and negative way. But I think how people get up from them and how people overcome them are some of the most inspiring things to hear. So I, I am thrilled to introduce Kopi, who I was introduced to around a year ago by Kevin Parker. And Kevin Parker, a board member, had mentioned to me for a while that you have to be Kopi. And he said this for, I think, almost a year before I even met Kopi, saying that she is arguably the single best presentation coach you'll find on this planet. Um, her father um, coached Ronald Reagan and was known as one of the best you know, presentation coaches. And Kopi took over the firm. And Kevin's words to me was that Kopi just puts the father to shame. She's that much even better than the father. And, and it's something that you hear, and I'm thinking, like, you know, Kevin, do I need presentation training? I mean, I think I'm pretty decent at this. And, and Kevin said, I'm telling you, she will change how you think and how you present. And so I met with Kopi, and I think there's a thing that you find that's interesting when someone really gives it their all. Um, and when I say give it their all, in any person you meet, any interaction you have, someone can just do the job. Someone can check off the box. They can go through and the time allotted. They can make sure they give you their coaching, and then it's done. But the amount of prep work Kopi had done on the company, on myself, on looking at even presentations I've done in the past, I, I literally, in the first five to 10 minutes, I was blown away by how all in, how committed and engaged Kopi was. And as Kopi spent time, not only with myself, but then spent time with our fast track uh, winners, spending time with some of the strap members, the feedback I got almost from everyone was that I, I feel like she's almost better than my mother. She's gone to know me so well, help me understand every nuance of what I'm doing, and, and just couldn't believe the commitment Kopi had put in. And, and this is what I've seen Kopi do. And just recently, Kopi had, had volunteered pro bono her time to help my father write a Nobel application, which has really brought my entire family to tears of just how good it was. And I think everything about Kopi I've known is she goes all in. She goes all in, and she gives it her all. So I was thrilled. To, to bring Kopi, let you hear her journey and life story. She was a startup entrepreneur before as well, um, and I'm just super pleased to let you guys feel and share um, what Kopi can bring to us. So without further ado, Kopi in Boston. Thank you, Charlie. I, I'm i blown away. I'm kind of glad neither my mother nor my father is in here to hear <laughs> some of the things you said. I'm not quite sure how my father would feel about that. But um, thank you so much. I really appreciate being here in front of you all today. And to, just to tell you a little bit about, about me and my path, which has certainly not been a, a steady line from point A to point B. And let's hope I can do this, Greg. Right? Yep. All right, so my first slide just shows what a winding road, it has a street sign of a winding road. And the point I wanted to make about this is that there's nothing about the path that I've taken that's been straight. It's all been all over the place, a very winding road. And things that I perceived as, at the time perhaps, as detours or as obstacles, turned out sometimes to be the biggest opportunities and the most wonderful things that could have happened, but I didn't know that until I looked back upon those things many, many years later. So basically seconding what Charlie just said, which is that I don't know that anybody should ever expect a straight line in their career or in their personal lives, because life is definitely going to throw you some pretty crazy things at some point or another. It does happen to all of us. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about what I do now so that you have a sense of, of what it is that I do, and then I wanted to go back and tell you a little bit about the windy path. So what I do mostly is that I help people. I would say that's the overarching thing. And I help people to figure out what their message is and to find their voice. And I'll give you examples. The sub-bullets are examples under each of these. I also help people to become aware and in control of how they come across to others. And again, an overarching thing is improving communication just in general. So whether that's on people's personal lives or their professional lives, for me it's about improving communication. So I wanted to give you some examples. What does it mean when I say that I help people find their message or help people to find their voice? So my first example is quite literal. There was, and this has happened not once, but several times. But one of the first times this ever happened, somebody came to me and it was a woman who was stuck in her career path in her firm. And her firm has over 3,000 people. And so she was at an inflection point in her career. And the feedback she got from people was, you just don't speak up. We don't get a sense of you. you we can't even literally hear you in meetings. So it was quite literally that she had a soft voice, quite, quite literally. And she was somebody, she was German, and many of you probably know that Germans see V's as W's. So she came to me and she said, Kopi, I need more volume. I need more volume. And in addition to the volume, I need gesture. I need gesture. So gesture and volume was what, but it's, it's interesting. You'd think perhaps these, these physical things are minor, having enough volume having adequate gestures, and yet in reality, those things, those physical things, convey confidence, they convey passion or enthusiasm for your job, and they convey being comfortable and relaxed in your own skin. That's what volume and gesture, those, those physical things used correctly and not stifled, can convey. And that's what was happening to this woman. So she and I worked together and quite literally, I taught her some breathing exercises. And what I do, my methodology is that I videotape people. And those of you who've worked with me know how awful that experience is in many ways. You see yourself on video and it's horrifying. And yet you also get this sense, ah, oh, my goodness, I had no idea that I came across as this. So I worked with this person a couple of times for two hours at a stretch to help her to find her voice. And she was promoted, I would say, within a month or two months of working with me. She's now one of the most senior people in this firm of 3,000 people. And I checked, I haven't seen her personally in a couple of years, but I checked the website of the firm occasionally to see, is she still one of the top people and one of the things was literally volume was literally a voice now let's I want to talk to you more figuratively about honing one's message and what finding one's voice can be so again a concrete example recently a client of mine really messed up this is a client with over 70,000 employees very senior group of people they messed up and they did something that really hurt one of their clients. And they had to have a meeting where their client was thinking of, of no longer working with them because this mistake was so big. And so they called me in and they said, okay, there are five of us, we're going into this meeting. What should we say? And, and I, so the first thing as I listened to what everybody was saying, I videoed them and what they were doing was they were, they were whining a lot. <laughs> and they were apologizing profusely. I'm so, so sorry. Everybody, the first thing every single individual on this five-person team did was apologize. Sometimes I would time them for over a minute at a time. So it became all about, oh my God, we're, we messed up, we messed up. 
and there was almost nowhere to go from there. So their voice was alternating between being whiny and being defensive. And so what we did through some listening exercises and again through the video and rehearsal of what it is they really wanted their client to know was we came up with a message that had to do with an apology, of course, but only one person giving a very straightforward and heartfelt apology. And then what, they, what I asked them to do was say how they fixed the problem and how they were going to ensure that it never occurred again. Because we all mess up, right? There's not one person here who hasn't messed up and this client was just like anybody else. They had messed up. And their client understood that. So they went into this meeting and very, very important. And the client had yelled in previous meetings, but the client did not yell in this meeting. And they retained the client, which was the good news. So that's what I, when I talk about fi finding people's voice, that's part of what I mean there. And becoming aware uh, and in control of how you come across to others. So just, again, this has happened numerous times. I'll get a phone call from somebody saying, so-and-so is amazing, amazing at his or her job, but is alienating people in the workplace. They're just, they, they're, they're interpersonal problems. Can you help figure out what that is? Now, that's an extreme case where, again, I'll sit down with somebody and try to figure out what it is, literally concrete things that you can change almost immediately that immediately alter others' perceptions of you. And that, of course, can be much broader because communication is about nonverbal and also your words. And it's about a combination of those two. And most of us focus on our words, but we don't really focus on what's going along with those words. So I wish I had a chair to demonstrate the guy who said to me, People say that I come across as being arrogant. I don't know why. He was literally lying down in his chair. He was lying down. He, he was virtually like this in his chair. And he would always put his hands behind his head. And that's how he talked to people. He said, why do people think I'm arrogant? <laughs> Not at all arrogant. So, and, and the improving communication. One of the things that has happened again over the years this is my 21st year now doing this, is that people have said to me, this isn't just for presenting in front of a large audience. What you're telling me isn't just about having an important meeting with, with clients. This is about how I can communicate with my significant other. This is also about how I can communicate with my parents, with my family, with my friends. And I've heard wonderful stories over the years about people improving their communication with their families after we've worked together. So this is all very, very exciting for me. And I love it when people realize that this is not just about presentation skills. It's about the value of communication. All right, so here starts the winding path. I, 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 things started out a little bit strange for me. I have a very strange name. My mother is legally blind, and I am an introvert. So what, what's this all about? Why am I showing you this slide? All of those three things are things that, unbeknownst to me when I was a child and an adolescent and in college, etc., are were things that ended up being very positive and ended up helping me in to get to where I am today, wherever that is, but th there were things at the time that seemed like handicaps. So I wanted to show you my, my funny name thing. Not everybody knows this about me. All right, that's my real name, Copeland. It's pronounced Copeland. <laughs> but notice that it's spelled C-O-W-P-L-A-N-D. This is an old family name, and my parents thought it would be really great to keep the original spelling, the original Middle English spelling, not thinking what effect this might have on their child.
All right, so thankfully, they decided to spell Kopi, C-O-P-I-E. So they did not spell it other ways. However, <laughs> many, many other people spelled it many other ways. And this, of course, was the most popular when I was growing up. <laughs> Just think about that one. So evidently, cow pie was the angel Gabriel in a uh, school play. And my parents, when they were in the audience and they saw this on, printed on the program, had to run from the room in hysterics because it was just so funny. And I had no idea why my parents were absent from this, uh, this school play. Now, this is a humorous thing, and it might seem very funny, but as a child, it was kind of embarrassing. And it can still be embarrassing to this day. So the, the story I love to tell about this is that the first time I ever flew business class and a client had decided to send me around the world, I was really scared. I was going to go first to Europe, then I was going to go to Mumbai. Hmm, I'm trying to remember the order now. Mumbai, South Korea, Tokyo, and I can't remember where else. Oh, Beirut. Okay, so Europe, Beirut. Mumbai, South Korea, and Tokyo. I'd never been around the world before. I'd never been to many of these places. And I'd never flown business class before. And I knew something was going to go wrong, that they weren't going to want me to be in business class somehow. So in those days, this was a number of years ago, I walk up to the business class desk feeling really insecure. And there's a person with a clipboard standing there. And I go, uh, my name is... Copeland is A. Copeland, and my maiden name is Lillian, A. Copeland Lillian. They said, no. Look, she looked at her list. No, nope, you're not there. You're not on the list. So I started to walk away because my worst fear, yes, I was, I was kicked out of business class. I started to turn away, and then I thought, you know what? It's my name. There is something going on here, and it has to do with my name. So my first initial is A. So it's A space. And then Copeland, as you remember, is C-O-W. Okay, so I'm going to show you what was on her list. <laughs> so I looked at the list and I saw a cow. And I said, you know what? That's me. <laughs> That's me. I'm a cow. And so they were all very happy that they discovered, because she said, we've all been wondering who a cow is. <laughs> so the point of telling you all of this, of, of this part anyway, is I have had to laugh a, lo a lot from a very young age, and, and know not to take myself very seriously, because from a very young age, I could have, I've, I've heard people say, oh my God, my name is so awful, I changed my name, I hated it that people teased me. Yeah, that, there, there was teasing and there were a lot of mistakes about my name. I actually grew to really appreciate having a different name because you don't hear too many copies, you certainly don't hear too many cows. You should see what telemarketers do with this to this day. <laughs> So the other thing is the legally blind mother. So what relevance does that have? My mother can see, but there are two things about how she sees. She sees only peripherally. She only has peripheral vision. She can't see when she looks straight on. So she looks at the world slightly askew. And one of the things that is really fascinating about that is that she also is a very peripheral thinker. She never tells a story where she starts in the beginning. Sometimes the stories just never end. They kind of peter out. But they always go all over the place. So from a very young age, I would sit on the floor. My mother could not see me because I would be kind of sneaky. I knew where she couldn't see me. And I would sit on the floor in her room, and I would listen to her conversations on the phone with all her friends. And she was a big phone person. She'd be on the phone literally for hours. And I would listen to my mother and try to make sense of what it was that my mother was saying. And I've, t I've told her this. If she were in the room, she would hopefully be laughing right now because I've said, Mom, it's partly because you're such a peripheral thinker and your stories don't start from point A and get to point B. 
that I can help people today who have a message, but they're really not sure what that message is. And they're not sure how to get from a starting point to a finishing point. And they're not sure what steps to take to structure their, their thinking. And one of the things that I love to do now is figure out, is pull out what somebody's key message is and say, you know what, when I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you very hard, what I'm hearing is this is your message. Let's create it together. Let me hear you express it. I've now told you what I think it is. What is it that you think it is? And we hone the person's message together. I'm convinced that if it hadn't been for my mother, just and to this day, she's like this, that being like that, that I wouldn't have developed the skill. The other weird thing about my legally blind mother is that she is the most observant person I have ever met. How can you be observant when you can't see? I don't actually understand it. But I would walk in the door, and I'm, I'm 57, so I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, and we all wore um, stockings all the time. All, uh, women always did. And I walked in the door at some point. I, this happened all the time. I'd walk in the door, she'd give me a hug, hello, and she'd go, do you have a run in your stocking? She's hugging me. I haven't even seen her look down. Do you have a run in your stocking? She, she was always right. I, now, maybe she was just playing the odds, and she knew that it was, it just would shock me that she knew I had the run in the stocking. But this, it, she is really one of the most observant people, and she's had to learn to recognize people through things other than being able to see them. So the other thing having a legally blind mother helped with is that I had to be her social director. So even if it was my godmother, Aunt Nancy, and this is somebody my mother had known from college, if we were in a public place and Aunt Nancy came towards us, I had to be able to say, Aunt Nancy, Mom. And then we'd be, you know, she would shake, she would hug or shake hands, whatever was appropriate, but I would be able to say to her, it's Aunt Nancy coming, and I had to also kind of gloss over it or make it okay when my mom didn't recognize somebody she'd known for 20 years. Because she didn't like to talk about not being able to see, and she liked to act as though she didn't, and she, again, to this day, likes to act as though she does not have a problem. And many people to this day don't know that she's legally blind. So all sorts of lessons and things that were very helpful. Now, being an introvert, I'm, I'm guessing, who here would call themselves an introvert? Who here thinks of themselves? Ah, very high percentage. And, and I, as well, am an introvert. Who would have guessed that I would do something where I'm speaking in front of groups and working with people and helping people speak in front of groups? Because it's very challenging when you're an introvert. My preferred method of communication with, when I'm by myself, I just want to read a book. I do not want to go to parties. I do not want to do, I, I'm fine one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two personally, but I'm often working with very, very large groups. And so I happen to work with a lot of introverts. I work with a lot of engineers. I work with a lot of mathematicians. My biggest client base right now is the financial world. And there are a lot of quants who have their PhDs in really esoteric mathematics, total introverts, and we really hit it off because I am also an introvert. So I know how challenging it is for them, really on a very personal level, to speak in front of whatever the client might be or whatever the group may be. So that's been very, very helpful. Though it also means that I have butterflies every single time I speak in front of a group I, I get deathly nervous, as many of us do. And so when people say to me, I'm so nervous, I don't know if I can function, I go, you know what? I may be just as nervous as you are. But there are, again, there are concrete physical skills that you can use that can make you appear to be confident. And if you, if you make yourself learn those skills and use them, you will always come across as being completely comfortable in, a, in an uncomfortable situation. Okay, so one of the things that was so tough for me as a, as a kid was that I had a ton of interests. 
And, it, and the picture that you see in the middle is rather chaotic. There are lots of bits and pieces all over the place. That's how it felt. I was interested in biology, French and other languages, psychology, other cultures, writing and literature, and speech and drama. And one of the hardest things that I found was to narrow down what I wanted to do. And I finally decided, you know what, I'm not going to narrow it down. I'm, I'm going to do it, I'm going to try to do it all. So when I was in college, I designed a general studies major. They did make me narrow it down a little bit. So I went for speech and drama, English and literature, and French. And I had to write a thesis. I had to write an application to justify having so many majors. And what I wrote in that thesis, I believe to this day, which is that almost none of us will have one career in our lives. Almost none of us will start at, will end up when we're in our late 50s doing what we started doing when we're in our 20s. That's what our parents did, or maybe our grandparents. But as our population ages more and more, as we get so that we're, we can live into our 80s or 90s, my father is almost 87, my mother is 83, my father retired at 80. As you can, as that, this is what our lives can look like, we're going to have multiple careers. And this was kind of a weird and revolutionary idea back in the 70s. And now, of course, you probably are aware that many people have written books about this, and this is now almost an accepted wisdom. But back in the 70s, this was weird. And people thought that you really had to have that one job, and you were going to have it until you got your, your gold watch or whatever at 60, whatever the retirement age was then, 65, 63. It keeps, I think it's going up. Um, I, I should have changed this one, but anyway, I had a lot of careers. So I started out at the age of 12 uh, with, and I'll show you, tell you what all those party balloons mean in a moment. And then from the ages of 13 to 22, and I, again, this is quite young, but I, I was a cook. So at the age of 12, I started a business running birthday parties in New York City, which is where I grew up. And there were a lot of mothers who did not know how to handle their kids and much less their kids' friends. So I had a business where I would interview with the mother, find out what kind of party she wanted, whether she wanted a theme. And then I would go out, and I, they'd, in those days they only needed to give me $50, and I would go and they'd give me cash and, and entrust this 12-year-old with this cash, and I would go to the store. And I would buy a piñata or other gifts, and I would buy all the prizes for the kids. I'd wrap everything. I would be the greeter. The mother just could stand in the background and dress up and look pretty. And I would be greeting everybody, all the children, and I'd run all the games. I'd award the prizes. I'd supervise the present opening. I would buy the cake if they wanted me to. And go through the whole cake cutting ceremony and all that stuff. And then after the kids left, I would vacuum and wipe all the counters and clean up. I can't remember what I charged. I mean, today it would have been hundreds of dollars. It probably was getting $25 a party. I don't remember. And eventually I hired my brother. He was my first employee. And he and I did this until we were 15 years old. He was kind of goofy and he did magic tricks. So that was great. He was just so silly. And they, were, they would love that. And then when I was 13, so this is concurrent. At, from 12 to 15, this is more what I did during the school year. So after school and on weekends, I mean after school I'd do the buying. The parties were all on weekends during the school year. In the summer, I started at the age of 13. We didn't have the same child labor laws. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> I don't know, but I was a short order cook. And it was in a beach club, but it was pretty busy. And I took all the orders. I took, I, there wasn't money because it was a beach club where people were members. People had to sign a, a chit, and then I would take all the chits and collect them. But I was, I was making BLTs and salads and tuna and hamburgers, and I did that for a number of years. 
both at that beach club until I was about 17, but then I also, after and during college, I was a cook in a Mexican restaurant, I was a cook in an Irish restaurant, in a vegetarian restaurant, so I did a lot of cooking. What does any of this have to do with what I'm doing now? It has to do, a lot of it does have to do with communication, I've got to say, because interviewing with those mothers and convincing, at 12 years old, convincing these Park Avenue mothers that they should give me money and I was just going to leave the house with cash and that I would come back and bring presents and run the birthday party. There was a lot of communication going on there and then just running the parties. And the cooking, often what it was, I mean, there was a, a restaurant in Somerville where we greeted the guests, there were about seven tables. It was called La Piñata, this is many years ago. We would greet the guests, we would seat them, we would take their order, we would cook their meal, we would serve them their meal, we would take it away, we would take their money, and we would say goodbye. We did everything, so it wasn't just cooking. I was also a disc jockey for a number of years, and then that far picture there is of a hospital. I did research for people getting their PhD. One person I did research for her getting her PhD in nutrition. And another person I did research on childhood obesity in the Boston public schools. And that became very significant later on. So disc jockey, there was a small daytime radio station called WCAS in Cambridge. And I don't think there's anybody here who approaches my age. But W, yes, you think? <laughs> Do you remember WCAS in Cambridge? No. It was a folk station that had a huge following, and there and it kept being threatened to go out of business. And so there were bumper stickers, "Save CAS," all over cars in Cambridge, Somerville, and all around the environs. And so I was a disc jockey for this folk. It became folk rock eventually. Bless you. And we, so anyway, I was a disc jockey there. I was a disc jockey in Missouri when I lived there for a couple of years. I had a country radio station called Copen with Copy. <laughs> the call letters of the station were K-O-P-N. So it was Copen with Copy on K-O-P-N. And then the other thing was that they had a French station. They had a French, it was, it was a public radio station. It was their uh, PBS affiliate. So they had a French show, and the French person was sick a lot that year. And because of my background in French, I would also do the French show. So that was the disc jockey stuff. So let's go back to the research for a minute. Remember, it was this woman, it was a doctor doing research on childhood obesity in Boston. And I'll just, one of the things I did for her was that I would compile height and weight charts from thousands of Boston public school system. Has anybody seen those height and weight charts for kids? They still they still have them, right? The blue one for the, they have the blue for the boy and, and pink for the girls, what they used to do. And you'd, you'd find the child's height and then you'd find the child's weight and you could tell what percentile your child was in. Some of you are nodding, is that still exists? Still exists. Okay, so those were very helpful because the next thing I did was that I started a business making clothes for overweight children. And so this picture, my daughter said, people are going to laugh at that picture And I, when I showed this to her last night. And, and I said, you know, they might, they might. Because one of the things I discovered in doing this business is that children who are obese, and this young man is, is obese by medical standards, children who are obese are absolutely torn apart by their peers a lot of the time. They're ridiculed, lots and lots of teasing. I had been, I had struggled with my weight as a child, so I had experienced some of that firsthand. And that's one of the reasons I had started this, this company. And I started it with a partner, a business partner, whose stepson looked a lot like this kid. So we discovered that there was no clothing that fit the overweight child. And if, if a child had to, wanted to fit his or her waist, because when you're a child who's overweight, you're, you're short. And all your weight, see how much there is in this boy's belly? 
all the way it goes into the belly. So what the children have to do, or the mothers, the poor mothers, is they buy clothes to fit the belly. So they might have a 38 inch waist, well here's the typical thing, 32 inch waist at the age of 8 years old, 36 inch waist at the age of 10 or 11 or 12. So these are waists that sizes that might be bigger than some of the waist sizes here, but these are children. So proportionately speaking, it's all like this. But then what happens to the length of the pant if they're wearing slacks? The length literally is sometimes a foot to a foot and a half too long. And the crotch of the pants hangs down to their knee. So that's one of the reasons you see kids kind of shuffling around like this, because there are no clothes that really fit. So what we did in 1985, is that my partner and I invented a new sizing system. And she left that part to me because I had had this experience compiling all the heights and weights of all the Boston Public School kids. And so I based the sizing system on height and weight. It's kind of like a women's pantyhose chart. Or, or the pantyhose charts are still like that, right? And you've got the SML, XL, whatever. I do that, I did that with the clothing. And so I, we used a lot of elastic and the clothes fit. It was, it was miraculous, it was amazing. Unfortunately, think about 1985. I, I'm guessing that some of you might not have been born then or you were very, very young. But was there an internet? I mean, the, the internet was like pie in the sky, like sci-fi stuff. I remember we, there was a company that tried to sell us on the idea that people would go to airports and they would uh, be able to order stuff from a kiosk at the airport and get it delivered to their house. And we were like, no, no way, that's just insane. That's insanity talking. So we thought the internet was just something that was a fantasy in somebody's brain at that point. So there was no internet buying, there was no internet shopping. So I think this was an idea whose time had come in some ways, but we were not the right people to manage it, my business partner and I. And I, I worked at Kids at Large. We eventually had 12 employees, which was huge for us. We had a huge warehouse space in Norwood, Mass. We were technically the manufacturers of our clothes. We sold all over the world. And we got so much publicity and again that was me what i did was we had no advertising budget so i said you know i'm going to get i'm going to get us publicity and my partner said yeah okay good luck with that and what i did was i sent out letters and i asked people i asked the reporter what they were most afraid of as a child and again now this is snail mail faxes were brand new faxes were only on that thermal paper and if you kept the paper around too long, not only would it curl up, but the writing would fade away. So technology was not helping us at this point. So I, I could, wasn't even faxing them yet. This is 85, 86. And I would send them a letter. What were you most afraid of, of a as a child? And was it fear of the dark? Were you afraid of monsters? How about fear of fat? And there's been research to show that that is one of the biggest fears in our society, is fear of fat. So these kids would have clothes that fit them, and to my extreme amazement, what I told people I was doing was, was offering a heightened self-esteem to these children. That, that, that only, Having heightened self-esteem can only be a good thing. And the question I got from reporters a lot was, when you make them feel better about themselves, aren't they just going to want to stay fat? Like, no, how, how can you ask me that question? <laughs> no, it, people, if people are happy with themselves, what does it matter whether they want to stay fat or whether they get thin? I, my goal wasn't necessarily to help them to get thinner. My goal was to make people feel better about themselves. Unfortunately, that company didn't work for a variety of reasons. Our bank failed, got rid of our loan, passed it to another bank. That bank failed. This was now, what, late 80s when all the banks were failing? And everybody kept taking our loan and then they would shrink it. And the way a mail order catalog business works and a clothing business works is that you have to purchase the materials and create your catalog 
months and months and months before it goes to the client, to the consumer, and you start to get orders in. So we had to front huge amounts of money, and we had to have a revolving line of credit. So that was one of the things that hurt us. And one of the other things was the lack of technology. We tried to make Macintosh computers work for our entire ordering system and our entire system of, of everything, bringing in the order, tracking the clients, and it wasn't adequate to the job. So eventually Kids at Large failed. I left Kids at Large in 1992, and by this time I'd been interviewed in the Wall Street Journal twice, I'd been in Newsweek, Business Week. I'd been on French TF1 television, very stupidly thinking that I could speak in French. I think it was a comedy segment that they used me for. I'm not positive, because I have no idea what I actually said to them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I was on TF1, French TF1 television. I was on all sorts of local television shows. I would bring my kids. They would be models. And that part, communicating with people, speaking in front of groups, was something that I found communicating something about which I was passionate, that I really loved. So I went on to a firm called Communis Bond, which coincidentally was the firm that my father worked at. And he worked in the New York office. I was applying for work in the Boston office, office which was in Cambridge. And I applied for work at Communis Bond, and I told them the experience, and I raised venture capital, and I negotiated with with funders and I'd been negotiating with vendors and I'd had seven years of this business experience and I wanted to focus on the communication part and Communis Bond took me in they trained me my father worked in New York I worked in Boston we never crossed paths at all and never worked together and that hap that went on for several years and then a few years later we happened to work together at the same time. We discovered that we liked working with each other. And when my father retired from Communis Bond in 1994 or 1995, I'm a little fuzzy, one of his biggest clients did not want to leave him. So that client came with, the, with Communis Bond's blessing, went with my father, and it was a huge, huge, huge client. And I began to work for my father, for Communis Bond, and for a couple of other firms. I was freelancing around for these firms. Over the years, my father had me take on bigger and bigger responsibility for the firm. And I think it was 2000, I officially became a partner. And in 2009, I bought the company from him. So all of these diverse weird things led the way for, I guess, for doing what I do now. And I guess that was my conclusion as well, that the winding road is what I think everybody should expect. Detours, I think as much as you can, welcome those detours, painful though they might be. Obstacles, even what could be termed tragedies or horrible events often have something that they can teach you and that you can grow from. And for me, what I'm doing now, I said it's been 21 years, I'm not sure that this is the last thing that I'm going to do with my life. It may be, I may want to go back and do more psychology stuff now because I find that so much of what I do relates to psychology and also more of the research stuff. Charlie, I loved working with your dad. It was really such an honor, and it reminded me, it brought back all those, all those years of doing research for various physicians, and so that also might be something I'd like to do more of. That's, I think I'm done. <laughs> and the winding road, how did you find your voice and message to be able to communicate it to other people? Yeah. All right, so how did I find my voice with all the winding road stuff that happened? 
how did I find my voice to communicate with that with people? It was, it was really hard, actually, very, very hard. And I really think it took time. It took, it took working one-on-one -on -one with people, and it took hearing back from some of my clients. I don't really think it was until I started working at Lillian Communications where I had the opportunity to do things like really sit down one-on-one -on -one with people and get feedback from others and discover what it was where I had the most value. And it's really evolved over the years. Other questions? Yes. Um, so you talked about how you had obstacles and how you should embrace the obstacles. And yeah. as an introvert, it's making yourself seem more confident. Yeah. What are your suggestions for someone who's more of an extrovert? Like, I consider myself a little more extrovert, but I have a hand tremor. So I come across nervous even when I'm not. Oh. Uh, maybe uh, people have stutters. Maybe people have other things. Sure. Do we embrace it? Do we run? Yes. Yes. So what do you do if you have something, you're not necessarily an introvert yourself, but there's something that might make you appear nervous, and whether it could be a physical thing like a hand tremor or something like a stutter, what can one do to, do you embrace it? Do you try to hide it? What do you do? So I feel very strongly that you should just embrace it and or in some ways ignore it. And maybe, again, this is something back from my mom being legally blind, where she doesn't tell people. She just acts normal. Now, when she got hit by a bus on Madison Avenue, yeah, it's like, okay, I'm legally blind. But <laughs> besides that, if she were presenting in front of me today, you would not know that she had any vision problems. So what about a hand tremor? What about a stutter? I work a lot with people who have various physical things. I work a lot with people, interestingly enough, with tremor. I worked with a guy at Georgia Pacific Paper Company. Do you guys know Georgia Pacific? He had worked on the floor in the manufacturing thing, in the manufacturing section, and he had, was missing digits. His hand got caught in a machine. And what he would do when he first started to present was that he would hold his hand behind his back, or sometimes both hands behind his back. Now that looks weird, doesn't it? Where are his hands? So what I would say to this guy was, use your hands. I don't notice. I, I don't notice a tremor if somebody gestures normally. I don't notice. I did not notice the missing digits when he gestured normally. When he hid it, I absolutely noticed it. So, and one more example, somebody, I, I've worked several times recently with somebody with a stutter. And one of the best ways to overcome a stutter, interestingly enough, is what you do with your eyes as you're presenting. If you look eye to eye with each person in the room, and you take a pause between those eyes, I, I have seen people with pretty major stutters have them virtually disappear. So what you do with your eyes affects how your voice appears. So just for those who might have vocal tics. Can I, can I ask a couple from New York here? Yeah, go ahead, John. So a <laughs> question here from Megan was, you mentioned skills to, to appear more confident when nervous in public speaking. Yep. What are some of those skills or tips? Okay. So what are the skills to look more confident when you're speaking in front of a group? The number one skill, so, so most of it is physical, it's nonverbal, and it has to do with what I just said to you, which is where you look, and it also has to do with where you stand. So the ideal stance to connote confidence is standing with your feet under your shoulders. So you want to have them a little broader. It's almost a golfing or a tennis stance. When your arms are not, when you're not gesturing, which is the other thing you should do to show that you're confident, you want to keep your hands hanging at your sides. But you don't want to glue them there. That's just where they occasionally rest. So this is a confident, upright pose. I, we took the lectern away. Lectern's over there. You don't want to stand behind anything. So you don't want to hide yourself. When, so you want to be have upright posture, hands at your sides, bless you, bless you. Lots of gestures, 
But the most important thing is something we call linkage, which is that skill I just said to you, where you look at somebody in the eye, you pause and you do not speak again until you find the next set of eyes. And the pausing is probably the most important thing because most of us rush, most of us let our eyes go all around the room. And so it makes me feel better because now I'm really looking at you. I'm, I'm actually feeling that I have a dialogue with you, but it also makes me look as though I'm, I'm confident. So I can be just dying inside. And, and hopefully you guys would never know. So, uh, by the way, yes, go ahead. Was, um, with so many careers, how did you know what you wanted? Oh, boy, you guys are tough. All right, so with so many careers, how did I know what I wanted? You know, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I think it has to, go, to do with satisfying the heart and, and, and the soul and, and the mind. So what I'm doing right now brings it all together. So I'm, I'm so excited when I work with somebody and I see people knowing what their message is when they were confused before or expressing it so much better when they weren't before. That makes me so happy. But it also stretches my mind. And working with a quantitative person, working with these PhDs in math, where I can barely understand what they're saying, but I've got to understand enough to make sure that I can help them to be clear in their message. That, that stretches my mind tremendously. And then doing things, Charlie, like working with your dad, I mean, that really made me, made me feel so good on, on just all levels because it stretched my mind, it made me feel good in my soul, and it made me feel like I was giving back. So I think that you really have to keep touching in with all of those things. I have one more question here. Um, for us employees at Next Jump, aside from professional coaching, do you have any advice on any exercise that we could do to improve our communication skills, or is it just to practice in front of people as much as possible? All right, so what advice would I give you to improve your presentation skills or your communication skills? And is it practice, practice, practice? I would say that one of the main things is practice, 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 but you want to practice the right stuff. So what most of us do is we focus on the wrong things. So I, my focus, and again, this I think comes from being an introvert, my focus is on the other person. This is much more uncomfortable for me today than what I do professionally, because what I do professionally is about the other person. And if you want to be a really good communicator, generally it's, it's listening. And there are ways of showing other people that you're listening and improving your listening skills. And there are also ways of, of non-verbally of conveying your interest. So without going through a whole program right now, just having an attentive posture, nodding, smiling, looking people in the eye, all of those things can help you with your communication skills. We had one. Do you have questions in Boston? Yeah, we had one more here. Well, you actually already answered one of my questions, but um, going back to different skills that you can use to be more confident, many of our interactions with our clients are all on the on phone. The phone. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations on sort of, you know, what you can do when you're on the phone and not physically present. With mm -hmm. the client. Mm -hmm. So what can you do when you're on the phone and you're not physically present to convey confidence and to communicate more clearly? So a lot of it is exactly the same as you would do if you were face-to-face -face with somebody. So you really have to visualize being with that person. And what I do with people who are on the phone is that I make them sit in the ideal presenting and listening position. And the ideal presenting and listening position is literally to sit on the edge of your seat. You don't want to be leaning back. Remember the arrogant guy? Why does everyone think I'm arrogant? And he's lying down in his chair. You can't do that. I know somebody who's on conference calls all the time. He puts on a headset, 
he lies down on the ground on his back, crosses his legs at his ankles, crosses his arms over his chest, and he closes his eyes. This is not what to do on a conference call. So what I recommend people do is you have a picture of somebody with whom you have a great connection. That person's picture should be on your desk. And when you're on the phone, you should look into the eyes of that person because that'll warm your voice up. And you sit in the attentive pose. Don't let yourself cross your legs. Don't let yourself put your legs out in front of you with your ankles crossed. Do not lean back in your chair. And the other thing is then verbal skills to ensure that your client knows that you're listening. And verbal skills are the, the most important one is reflection, where you say, so what I hear you saying is, if I understand you correctly, you're telling me this. Let me just make sure I got everything you said. And you literally want to say back to the person on the phone pretty much word for word without without improvisation or sticking your own perspective in, you want to reflect back what you've heard the other person say. It's painful and difficult for you because you want you think you add value by adding stuff. You actually add more value by just reflecting word for word what that person has said because that makes them know that you've got it. Okay, I have a question here that it's two different questions, but they're very related. So one person asked about that we have a decent amount of introverts at the company. Mm. What are pieces of advice you would give to introverts in an extroverted world? Yeah. And that's tied to this other question, which says, how do you continually face your nervousness of being in front of crowds or doing something that makes you uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay, so two questions there. Do I have advice for introverts in an extroverts world? Let me start with that one. There's actually a book that I, I'm going to get the title wrong, but it's called Introversion, the Power of Introverts in an Extroverts World, I believe, it, almost exactly as that question is worded. And I've had the opportunity of listening to the author of this book speak, and she believes that introversion and that introverts are the new diversity, because she feels that our culture is so extroverted-oriented that introverts really are, are the new wave because introverts, we add a lot. We're analytical. We sometimes work best on our own. We sometimes need to go off and just be by ourselves to process. I need a lot of alone time. We, and, and we sometimes, if, if people understand the power of introversion and people who run companies understand the power of introversion and the power of introverts, that can be very, very helpful. I think that Remembering to speak up, I think that remembering to be direct, it's really hard as an introvert sometimes to just be direct and say whatever it is that's bothering you or say whatever it is. I find that my brand of introversion anyway, sometimes it's easier just to avoid stuff and I'd rather take it all on myself than express it and I have to push myself not to be that way. I have to push myself to be very direct and straightforward rather than to try to go things more obliquely, which might feel more comfortable. But I would recommend the book. It's really, really, really interesting. Now, what do I do with my extreme nervousness? Oh, goodness. My uh, honorary daughter, Melissa, is here. She's been taking photographs in the back of the room. And Melissa and I have known one another since Melissa was pretty young. And uh, she can attest to... One of the things I'll do is I'll talk to people and I'll just say, I'm very, very nervous. The other is to breathe in advance. If, you're, if, you're, if you know you're gonna present, you should do breathing exercises that are very much like what you do in yoga or in meditation. If you, can do so, if you have any sort of meditative practice, but you wanna inhale and then you wanna exhale and have your exhale be twice as long at least as your inhale. So if you have something you're scared about, use this. It's amazing how much it will calm you down. Make sure that you're breathing from the diaphragm and not breathing from the chest. Because if we get nervous, we will start to breathe from our chest and that's almost like hyperventilating. And you can pass out. I almost passed out in front of a group once before I learned this technique. 
So you want to do you want to do breathing, and then you want to do positive visualization. It helps for me that I've done this for 21 years. It doesn't make the nervousness go away, but generally I can say, okay, I'm probably not going to drop dead in front of them. I've done so many embarrassing things. I've I'm drinking water very carefully in front of you. What I love to do, evidently, because I've done it three or four times, is I like to miss my mouth and pour it down my chest. <laughs> so, you know, if you have a fear of speaking and you're an introvert, how, what more embarrassing thing can you do than pour water on yourself and then have to stand for six more hours in front of people? So I've had a lot of practice, but, um, but that goes back also to not taking yourself very seriously. Toby, thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie.